Okay. Oh. There we go. We're officially recording. So everyone, welcome to uh, our first session, part one. Uh, it happened on Washington Square, the beginnings. We're going to go through 1900. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Emily Fulp with us here tonight. Um, she wrote the book, It Happened on Washington Square. I believe it's like, it's not technically in print, but um, I know the Strand always has copies. Um, and I found copies uh, online as well. So if you want to get a copy, um, it is floating out there. Um, it is a great exploration of the history of the park, again, through an art historian's lens. Um, and um, uh, I also would like to uh, thank Emily. She is a volunteer with us. She is uh, one of our board members um, for so long. So um, we have put this together. Again, we do this uh, for our greeter volunteers, but we thought we'd welcome a greater um, group of donors um, just because it's really such a fascinating talk. So um, we'd love to be chatting with a glass of wine in hand and some noshes, but we couldn't quite do that this, this season, so we decided to take it virtual. So um, again, questions in the, uh, in the chat or in the, um, or in the Q and A, and we'll get to them in the end. If you're having technical difficulties, put it in the chat and I'll, and I'll uh, reach out, um, I'll reach out to you through that. So thank you so much, Emily. Welcome. Okay. Um, I'm looking forward. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Um, I always get excited when I think about Washington Square. And when I first started delving into its history, I was really amazed, impressed with how much of what I was finding seems to seem to resonate with where we are today. And I'll be discussing some of those issues um, of our current conditions, the disparity of wealth, racial strife, labor unrest, uh, all kinds of social unrest and social protests, um, and urban decay. We'll be talking about some of these this week, and then next week when we talk about the 20th century, of course, we'll, we'll go on with, on that uh, path. First of all, I'm going to let you know that Washington Square, of course, is a small park, but it has a very long history. And the documents go back to the site uh, for very specific reasons. And we know 380 years ago, there were documents that refer to certain geological and uh, topological conditions. Some of you may know Washington, well, Manhattan is a long skinny island and at the northern end of it, there are very large rocks, great heights with great heights. That uh, Manhattan schist and nice uh, continue and resurface, they get a little lower and then they'll resurface in Central Park where Belvedere Castle, for example, sits on Vista Rock, which is 40 feet high. And then as you go to Midtown, the rock is underground, but it provides the bedrock for the Midtown tall buildings. When, it, when we get down toward Washington Square, that rock suddenly takes a dip and there is like a bowl that must have been created by glaciers thousands and thousands of years ago, leaving sandy soil, some marshy land, and a creek, of course, running through it that many of you know as Mineta, the Dutch called Bestavers Creek. Um, those features of the creek and that of Mineta, um, of Mineta and the, the um, swampy land, and the fact that there was this drop off, uh, make it easy for us then to place Washington Square site in some of these documents. I wanna go back first, have you look at this map? I wish I had a pointer, but I'll have to show you anyhow. Um, what we're talking about, first of all, is that very prominent long line that is, um, you can see going from about the middle of the island moving north. If you look on the more contemporary map, you'll see it would compare to where the Bowery is. Now you can see on the contemporary map where Washington Square is, and you'll notice if you look to the east, you can see um, St. Mark's, the mark for St. Mark's and St. Mark's Place, and the church that would be there. That is what we can see uh, pretty much if you look at that very long dotted line that comes off that, uh, the Bowery line. And then drop down a little and you'll see a dark spot. I hope you're all with me. And that's actually um, the Church of St. Mark's. And there's a path of dotted line that leads from there, crosses over the Bowery, and in very fine letters, you can see the writing Sand Hill, and that very fine narrow path will continue to another more prominent white path that we know as Greenwich 
Avenue, but was then known as Monument Place. These are old Indian paths, and it's nice to know when we walk in our neighborhood that we are walking on well-trodden pathways. The mo the, um, I wanted you to get these sites because then you see how far downtown where the Dutch first settled, it's really a long distance. When the Dutch came in 1624, they brought um, some slaves from the Dutch West Indy Company, and these maybe 11 and then more, and then men and then women, uh, and they joined the company. They would have uh, made some farms. They would have helped with whatever needed to be done. As time went on, the uh, settlement of New Amsterdam was not really thriving. Most of the settlers were much more interested in fur trading and making a lot of money than in tending farms and pastures. Um, and so there got to be some difficulties. In addition, the Lenape Indians who were in the area were also threatening them as they felt their land was encroached upon. By 1640, the new uh, administrator, Wilhelm Kieft, came over and thought something had to be done. And he decided, he made a very pragmatic solution. He established a practice of providing land grants to some of the African, Africans who'd been brought over as slaves. And throughout the downtown from about what we know as Canal Street and on up through Soho and uh, Noho, he made these small patches of grants and freed the, the African Americans, the Africans then, um, so that they could farm as they wished. However, there were conditions. The conditions um, were that he, the, the male, the father of the farm, the land grant, would be made free, uh, and his, the grant was made to the wife as well. Most of the grants were made to slaves who'd been in the company for 17 or 18 years. The Dutch didn't necessarily keep slaves for a lifetime. At any rate, they set the slaves free and provided, and they gave them the land, provided that they made payments of portions of their crops, 22 bushels of any two crops, corn, wheat, peas, beans, plus one fat hog every year. If they fail to fulfill these conditions, they would return to servitude. However, the children of these former slaves, even those unborn, would return to servitude. So it wasn't all so rosy. But we do know that one man, Anthony Portuguese, was granted some plot of land that was near the cripple bush, which is the word for swamp, and that area that was the path uh, along that rocky cliff um, and along Mineta Brook. So a good part of his farm would have covered the site that is now Washington Square. These farmers stayed on their site, the black farmers stayed on their site until the English came in 1664. The English took over all their land and many of, uh, many of these people then had to flee or they, they left, they scattered. Many of them went to the area that we know now as the Minettas. Um, just southwest of the park, and there was a, a set, there was a group of them who stayed on the this area was known as Little Africa, and there was a sizable number, a good black population there until the 1930s. Time goes on, and of course uh, the Americans will begin to settle in and fight a uh, fight a war. And um, we have, oh, okay, uh, and we'll see that time goes on. And before that happens, when we get to discussing Monroe, there's something else that happens. By, after the Civil War, there was a lot of trade. The trade increased, and that meant a lot of ships coming into the harbor. And on those ships were mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes brought yellow fever. And in the 1790s, there were great epidemics they would become much worse in the summer and then abate in the winter. So in the summer, numbers of people who could afford it would move up out of the city to their country homes. And many of the English had established country manors and, and uh, nice country second homes for themselves. Um, but the yellow fever was causing such havoc and it was so devastating to the city. Thousands were dying. In 1798 alone, there were 2,000 deaths. And of course, the city, the Common Council, the 
ruling authority in the city realized something had to be done. There was no more burial room in the city. And so they established what was um, known as a potter's field on what we know now as Washington Square. There was some clamor about this. They had to acquire the land from various uh, people who had property there. But even so, the, the conflict came with nearby landowners, some of whom, including Alexander Hamilton, were not happy about a cemetery that would be used for paupers or people who couldn't afford their own burial. And they complained and they wrote letters. They didn't they thought it might be smell. They thought there might be, of course, adverse real estate values. But ultimately, the city council had its way, and they established um, a, the potter's field. Now, a potter's field is named for a phrase that occurs in Matthew 27 in the New, the New Testament. After Judas repented for betraying Jesus, he gave his reward of 30 pieces of silver to the priests who, quote, bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Now, yellow fever had first afflicted the city in 1795, and then it would happen on again, on and off for the next 20 years or so. There were other epidemics after that, but it was specifically yellow fever that was causing all the deaths in the city at this point. What we also see is um, already we see the diversity or the disparity of income. We have wealthy landowners, landowners who have second homes complaining about a burial field that would hold those who had the least, who could not even afford to be buried. At this point, by the end of the 18th century, the richest one-fifth of New York's population owned four-fifths of the wealth. The bottom half owned less than 1 20th. In other words, they owned maybe 5% of the wealth that was calculated then. If any of this sounds familiar, of course, it's gone on and on. It will be an old story. The potter's field will fill up, unfortunately, all too rapidly, and it held eventually 20,000 bodies. There was um, the grave digger who had a house near the field, he often also served as the hangman. And there are legends about the wonderful elm, the Dutch elm being used to hang. In fact, it wasn't, but there was a gallows on the site because there had been a prison on 10th Street at the river, Newgate Prison. Prisoners would come down and they would be hung, duly hung at the, at the gallows there. But all of that was to end in 1825 when the field was filled up. And it was decided since there were bodies underneath, what could be done with this land, but it had to be kept green. Now, New York already had been plotted out according to a grid plan. And that grid plan didn't leave a lot of open space. There was a little square down in City Park. There was a little, there'll be other little squares, often the result of burial grounds. Um, but there wasn't room for what would be called a parade ground where the militia volunteer militia could, could train and um, on some regular basis. And so it seemed convenient and appropriate for the area, this site that had been the burial ground to become a parade ground and it would soon hold soldiers. We're going to be seeing some pictures of that soon. Now with the open green, as always happens, the real estate values start to go up and some very clever men who were merchants downtown decided to get together and lease some land along Washington Square North. On the right is the east, the row, and on the left is Washington Square West. The east side of the square sits on land that had belonged to the Randall family. Uh, they were both the father and son were privateers. They've made a lot of money and they decided they wanted to, uh, when they would after they died, they would give their, their money, their land, for a sailor's home. It became obvious that it would be far more uh, lucrative if they leased that land instead and they built their home, which they did on Staten Island. So the land of, of the row was actually leased from holdings that belonged to Sailor Snug Harbor, and those leases contributed to the well-being of the many sailors who lived at Snug Harbor for uh, really decades and decades. The 
Buildings that you see on, that we know that we're so familiar with on the East are among the first of and the finest examples of the Greek Revival style. That style includes the very simple uh, pediments, the beautiful, the, the over the doorways, the beautiful columns that are, are nicely refined. The difference with the houses on the row and on the west is that everything was of the finest quality. The three gentlemen who decided to build this row, um, Tom, John Johnson, James Borman, and James Morrison, knew that um, they could attract people from downtown because downtown was getting very crowded. Henry James wrote, the murmur of trade had become a mighty uproar and the wealthier residents left the clamor of Wall Street for the quiet uptown. And when he writes in his novel, Washington Square, um, that's the phrase, that his doctor was one who had fled from downtown. Well, there are no doctors on the square. Instead, it was really uh, for the mercantile class almost completely. And that was true on the West as well. The, on the West is the home at number 18 of Henry James's grandmother, Elizabeth Walsh. Um, it's a few doors down to the left side of that picture. That house became so deteriorated that it was torn down in um, 1947. But it was that house on the square that Henry James went to as a child. He never lived there, but he would visit his grandmother after school. And that was how he came to know what we think of as the park when he was a young boy. Okay. The houses were not just very fine houses, but they also indicated some changes that were occurring. Because they were of a distance from downtown, and those days that seemed like a long distance, the, the men who would go down for business would have to take their carriages, and they didn't make the trip to come home at lunch. Uh, when they lived downtown and their houses were near Wall Street and right near their working places, their places of business, they would come home for their big midday meal. But living now on Washington Square, they would stay down and this is when the first restaurants, when the oyster bars along the river start to do a good business. And there's a whole change then in how uh, families will come together for dinner at dinner time, for our dinner. Um, it also, in it's because they needed to travel, uh, this started the innovations of carriages and uh, omnibuses, horse, horse carriages that would carry a lot of people. So there are many changes, which I hope we can get into another time, um, but it's a very exciting change and development in the city. And of course, this at this point, this would have been home to people of some means. It would have been known as a very affluent place. And seeing how it was coming along so well, and it was just such a, a lovely spot to have developed, uh, NYU eyed the property, and the people on the, on the north side of the park eyed NYU, and saw that that would be a welcome addition to the neighborhood. Um, the University of the City of New York, soon to we know as, as New York University, uh, was founded in 1829. There is a picture of it there, and as you can see on the right, and on the left is uh, just a detail of one of the row houses with that beautiful brick and the, the marvelous contrast formed from the white marble. Luckily, the, that row, the exterior has been preserved so you can see the final, the beautiful details of the balustrades as well as the front railings. Um, the house, the NYU housing, uh, rather the NYU building uh, was not, started until about 1832 or three, when the other houses on the row were pretty much complete. Um, the houses on the row were of a grander nature than many of the houses that you know from the West Village. For one thing, everything on the outside is marble. The inside, they would have had a front parlor, a back parlor. There would have been a full dining room. The stairways go went straight up to the top floor where there were the servant quarters. Most of these people kept five to seven servants um, and the privy was out and back. There was a stables and the garden. A lot of that has changed, but at least we still have the, the very lovely brick and marble um, front. On the, in the back, of course, we have one of the uh, 
we have one of the alleys. On the other side of the street behind Washington Square West, we have um, the other, one is Washington Muse and the McDougal Alley across the way. So those are all precious remnants of this past. So NYU will build and some of the men who live on the square will become their trustees. They will help found this, this uh, university and will support it, send their sons to school there. Um, the university was also based on an idea that came from London, just as Washington Square itself was modeled on developments in London. The university was modeled after the University of London um, which was a much more modern place than Cambridge or Oxford. Um, London, the University in London, for the first time offered economics and foreign languages. And that was how NYU originally started. It was to be a modern university where there would be some awareness of social sciences and the needs that would be appropriate for businessmen in the modern world. Uh, the square itself, and you can see from this picture, might resemble in your eyes some of the squares we would know from London, which were also just developing a little bit before Washington Square. Um, when we think about uh, all those uh, nice squares in the West End of London, that was really the inspiration, too, for Washington Square surrounded by residential buildings. Um, the you might note the architecture now, compared to the Greek revival, that very restrained style that was just coming into vogue in our country, uh, we see that the university seems quite elaborate and it's done in a very um, fancy Gothic revival style, which is what the, uh, and the people in charge of NYU at the time, what the president and his board decided would be the most appropriate. They wanted to be a modern university, yet they wanted to look like Cambridge and Oxford. And so uh, the firm of town, Davis and Dakin, designed a very ornate facade. That stone building stood there until 1895. Next to it, across the way, you can see two towers of a Methodist church uh, designed by Menard Lefebvre. And this uh, lithograph dates from the 1840s. One of the most beautiful aspects of the so-called university building was the chapel, which was designed by one of the partners of that firm, and he did most of the designs of the building, Alexander Jackson Davis. Uh, the chapel was a wonder with this um, ersatz, I'd have to say, uh, fan vaulting, but it had wonderful windows, stained windows, and was really considered to be one of the marvels at the time, one of the most in beautiful interior spaces. And you can see it in the center of uh, the building from the outside there on the right. Now the university building, as you can imagine, was very expensive. It cost something like $140,000 at the time. That was a lot and it really emptied the treasury. So as a result, uh, the uh, board of NYU decided that they would rent out a lot of the space. They only had uh, maybe 20 or 30 students in the beginning. And even as they grew, they wouldn't really need the whole building right away. And so they rented rooms and studios and lab space to a number of people who are artists or professors. Among those who took space in the university building really very early was Samuel Morse. Morse was an artist. He was hired to teach the literature of uh, the fine arts. He made a lot of portraits, um, but he wasn't altogether happy with his uh, painting career with his artistic career. However, in this wonderful landscape with the university building, you can see the university building there on the left, and somehow Washington Square has been transformed into a very romantic lake, and the, uh, across the way are some kind of towers. I don't know whether exactly what's there or a castle, but it's a fantasy landscape. Now, if you think that maybe there was reason he thought he wasn't so successful. He understood that he would have to try another direction. And so he gave up painting around 1836, 37, and devoted himself to scientific endeavors. While in Europe, he'd heard about the electromagnetic possibilities for a, a telegraph. And so that's what he began to invent, what he began to work on. Uh, when he was 
while he was at the university building, he came to know professors of chemistry, William Draper, uh, another scientist who helped him with the copper cables. And uh, together, and with the help of Samuel Colt, whom you know was the inventor of the uh, six-shooter, also living in the university building, um, they developed, and he developed, most importantly, the code. It was the problem with previous attempts at anything like a telegraph was there wasn't an adequate code. And Morse came up with what we know today as the Morse code. In January, on January 24th of 1838, uh, Morse with his companions at the university building fed out 10 miles of copper wire around all the trees in the park and then came, brought that wire back up to, it was uh, Professor Draper's office and tapped out their message. The message they tapped out was attention the universe by kingdom's right wheel. Now that's not what we usually think of as the first telegraph message, but this was it. And we even have in the NYU archives, there is an invitation to this demonstration of the telegraph. It still exists uh, from 1838. A few years later, by 1844, um, when there was a more official demonstration of the telegraph, uh, we'll get to the phrase, um, the uh, what God hath wrought. And that's, of course, the one that most people associate. Because of Morse's invention of the telegraph, all the lines came back to New York. Within a few years, there was an Associated Press founded. And the Associated Press could telegraph reports of the Mexican War that was taking place in the 1840s. And of course, that meant that any activity on the stock market could be regulated by telegraph. So what happened in Philadelphia or Boston would also come back to New York. There's no question that Morse's invention, and particularly with his code, that his invention helped make New York um, a certainly um, a, a capital, not just a commercial capital, but more than that, a communications capital. Now, another man who entered the university building, it was a real catch-all uh, several years later, was Winslow Homer. Homer had come down from Boston as a young man. He was a, he had just beginning to teach himself how to paint, but he was an excellent draftsman, and he had been doing, he came to work as an artist reporter. You'll know that he goes off to the Civil War, makes drawings, which will then be uh, transcribed on wooden plates and run through the presses. He makes a lot of drawings um, of uh, the, um, during the Central War, uh, during the Civil War of soldiers in camp and capturing many of their uh, not military necessarily activities. But when he came back to his, his digs on Washington Square, he would often go up to the roof to paint and people would, would start to visit him. He began to use the drawings that he'd made during the war and, and transfer them and to make them into paintings. This one is one of his most famous prisoners at the front and it dates from 1866. Apparently he had kept uh, some uniforms from the, the current regiment, the uh, 7th Regiment, which was to drill on the square, um, and he had the rifles and he had some other paraphernalia all ready to paint, for him to paint to be accurate in his studio. And speaking of the soldiers and the regiments, uh, in this area, there was a regiment that was raised as a militia. It was the 37th Regiment. It was a very well-to-do kind of fancy regiment. Um, and they loved to drill on the square. There were records in one diary of one of the participants who said mostly, this looks as if it was for a real show, but mostly they would drill and then go out and drink. But nonetheless, there were times where they would parade up and down. You can see you're looking now east to the university building and to the church next to it. And maybe things look a little larger. These are known as bird's eye views. So they appear, the park appears a little more immense than you might normally think it is. But you can see little anecdotal details and the, the children and uh, the neighbors looking on as the regiment passes by. Uh, that 7th Regiment um, will go off to Civil War and will serve there. Um, and they will see some other pictures of some of the things that they did to help keep 
piece as well. Um, you'll notice at this point that the square is rather austere. There are trees, but the lines that, that run east-west, they're very broad avenues, there aren't any curves. This was how the parade ground was first set out. And we'll see that that will change uh, when the park uh, becomes part of the new parks department um, several years later, 20 years later. This is picture dates from 1851. Wait a minute. Let me just show you this one first. Um, only a few years later, there is a big change. There is a big change to Washington Square. Um, well, yeah, I'm going to show you this one first. Uh, there's a big change that comes to Washington Square, and that's, of course, the fountain. The first fountain goes in in the 1850s, not long after we see that picture of the, the men drilling. And it was really a celebration, as were other fountains in the city at the time, a celebration of the coming of the Croton water. The first time New York really got its own fresh water. The fresh pond and other sources further downtown were becoming really polluted and very dangerous. And fresh water was a scant supply for the city. Um, the Croton Aqueduct brought the water to reservoirs in what we know was became Central Park, and from there the water would be fed into pipes and brought to the various places downtown so people could finally have access to fresh water. This fountain is quite large, it's very grand, apparently the, the center uh, faucet would shoot up great plumes of water and you can see people watching. It's a very beautiful old photograph that's in the collection of the Getty and it's by a photographer named Silas Holmes. But the park will soon see some unrest. And here we have, um, it won't be the first time the park witnesses unrest, but here we have a scene that shows the um, military encampment in Washington Square. It was a picture that was made for Frank Leslie's Illustrated Magazine. In July of 1863, the first draft ever, the first draft to supply the Union Army with soldiers was held. The law went into effect in March and people knew that there was going to be a draft. It was a dismal time for the Union. Um, there was a lot of concern and there had been 100,000 absentees, soldiers who just ran off and never came back. The Union was desperate. They, they initiated the draft to start all around the country, in, first in New York, in, uh, in July, on July 11th. By July 13th, there was such an uproar, the rioting started. Now this is one of the examples we have again of the underlying racial tensions that really do permeate so much of our country's history. There was a lot of concern about the draft. People didn't want to go off and get killed. There was concern that why was this happening? The Emancipation Proclamation had just come through in that January, and there were a lot of Irish and Iron German, mostly Irish immigrants, who really were concerned that they would lose their jobs to the free Negroes that were sure were, were going to come flooding into the city. And they were just general tensions in the city at the time that led to great rioting. This rioting uh, took the form of setting fire to places. There was a lot of looting. Uh, and there was a lot of massacre, too, for uh, black males. They, it tended to center in our part of the city because there were so many more black people living down here, and especially to the southwest. Um, and on one street um, over further west of 7th Avenue, there was a lynching. Um, and even the presumed to be abolitionists were threatened at their door by these wild mobs who were coming. Over 120 people were actually killed. 18 of them were black and many of them had been mutilated uh, in very horrible fashion. To keep the peace, the 
7th Regiment was brought in and they had just been fighting at Gettysburg. You might remember Gettysburg was early July in 1863. These poor troops must have been exhausted and there were other troops that came along as well and they bivouacked on the square. This is a wonderful picture that shows the neighbors coming out to say hello and thank, you know, thank the army for keeping the peace. Now this had been done once before. Uh, that there would be soldiers who would come out to keep the peace. When the university building was first built, it was made of marble. And it was uh, to save money because it was so expensive, the contractor, Alicia Bloomer, decided to use um, prison labor. Well, the local stone masons were furious. The stone cutters rose up and they too had uh, a riot that would have taken place right on Washington Square, and they also looted Alicia Bloomer's store, did $22,000 worth of damage, and could only be calmed down when that regiment, the 37th Regiment, came and stayed in the park for quite a while. Uh, the regiment did stay in the park for several weeks um, just to keep things quiet, but those draft riots still are one of the blackest times in, of New York history. After the Civil War, things started to calm down, uh, particularly the sons of John Johnson, one of the founders of the row, were interested in art. One built himself a house on the corner of 8th Street, a very fine mansion, and uh, which housed, and it housed a, a wonderful collection that he um, managed to, to garner. He even opened it up sometimes for visitors. His brother, James Borman Johnson, um, invested because he saw that more artists were coming to the square. He invested in building the uh, 10th Street Studio Building, which we'll talk more about uh, when we discuss artists in the square. But there was a lot of activity. Writers were starting to live nearby. And this wonderful, including Mark Twain, who lived up 23 Fifth Avenue and liked to visit in the park. And so when Robert Louis Stevenson came to New York on his way up to, uh, for his cure at Saranac Lake. Uh, he had consumption, which we know is TB. Uh, he and Mark Twain had a nice visit. The drawing was made several years later, but it's a lovely reminiscence. Now, by the time they had their visit, uh, we know that things had changed in the park, even though we don't uh, have the, you can't really tell from this picture. In 1870, the park was taken over, Washington Square was taken over by the newly formed Parks Department as part of uh, Boss Tweed's new rule. And he put one of his cronies in charge of the Parks Department. And so much of the work was done as people complained where some dirt would come one way, then it would go back the other way and all of this so that they'd earn their wages and uh, you know that could be their, their work for the day would be well compensated. Um, but the park was done, and it was done under uh, Ignaz Pilot, who had worked with Olmsted at Central Park. And we still see vestiges of that 1870 park in some of the curving paths that go through, the, especially on the corners of the parks. Ignaz Pilot knew how to plant trees very well, and the park was graded, and uh, there was a new fountain put in. The fountain has always been an issue because when it was first put in, and the new one in the same place, it was centered on the park going east to west, not north to south. Because initially, after the parade ground in 1830, Fifth Avenue was not a very important street. And so the fountain really was a centerpiece looking from a different direction. At any rate, that's where the fountain stayed until the more recent renovation when it was moved to line up behind the arch. And with the more people coming into the park and with certainly with um, some of the immigrants coming in and the, along the south side of the park, the park goers and the population is shifting. There will be more and more people coming through what were once single family residences and crowding into them as tenements. And they begin to line the south side of Washington Square and, and back through the South Village. Um, the, 
the Italians who visited the park felt that it was the perfect place for a monument to their hero, Garibaldi, who had helped in the Risorgimento, the um, reunification of Italy. And they raised the money for this wonderful statue by Giuseppe Torini. And of course, it's now our beloved uh, Garibaldi statue, which stands currently on the northeast part of the park. A few years later, that was the first statue. A few years later, an engineering society decides to put a statue in Washington Square for no reason that anybody can imagine. Alexander Lyman Holly brought over the steel uh, industry, brought over the practice of steel blasting, the Bessemer process, and made a successful start in Troy, New York. The engineers who benefited from his uh, invention from his innovation felt that he should be awarded and they got together and also raised the money and found the spot um, for this beautiful statue with a lovely base um, and it was finished and installed in 1891. At this point we all know the park is not very large and so the parks department said that's it no more statues in the park and so we have only those two but they have become landmarks, iconic spots for gathering and of course music making and busking of all sorts. Another uh, important feature along the park is Stanford White's Baptist Church, the Judson Memorial Church, which he uh, was hired to do around 1890. The park, uh, the um, Judson Memorial is an interesting edifice and it's an interesting institution. It was built and fundraised for uh, from his by his son Edward Judson, who wanted to honor his father Adoranum Judson, who was a missionary. And the son Edward said he didn't need to go off, although his father had gone off to other lands, translated the Bible into exotic languages. And and uh, Edward Judson said that's not necessary. We can be a uh, a missionary in our own neighborhood. Even though most of the people he felt who needed care and social services might have been Catholics, he felt that his church could reach out to them. From the very beginning, Judson has had that social activist base. Uh, Stanford White was hired to do the, the design and he models it on Italian predecessors, beautifully using, inexpensively using brick tile and terracotta, and he raised that tower, which would be used for apartments um, and for um, leases and rentals uh, to help raise money for the church. One interesting side effect is that um, to raise the money, Edward turned out to be a pretty good fundraiser. He hustled all around the country, and when uh, John D. Rockefeller, the oil magnet, um, realized that he was struggling so, he issued a challenge grant, a very modern idea. He said he would contribute $15,000 for every 50,000 that Edward could raise and with a cap of 40,000. So when Judson finally was built for a few hundred thousand dollars, it contained this gift from John D. Rockefeller. The man who took over the leasing and the business of the tower was James Knott. He was very successful and he helped contribute to the well-being of the, the, well, the good finances of Judson Church. He went on then to build the Holly Hotel, which we know now as Hayden Hall, and then he uh, took over managing the Earl Hotel, which we know now as the Washington Square Hotel on the north corner. By 1889, the population in the square had significantly changed and many of the people who had lived around the square were moving away. Uh, it was no longer altogether such a posh place. But nonetheless, uh, there were some people there who still wanted to claim some glory for the square. And at the time of the centennial, the, the centennial celebration of George Washington's first inauguration, the end of April 1880, uh, 1789, one resident who lived on the corner of Washington Square West uh, decided to do something about it. And he said he had a dream 
the, the whole centennial celebration was organized because New York wanted some attention. Chicago had already taken over the idea, the 400th celebration of Columbus's arrival, and they would host their major, what should have been 1892, but was held in 1893, the Columbian Exposition. Philadelphia had already had their centennial uh, in 1876 from the uh, Declaration of Independence and the forming of America, the United States. And so New Yorkers were looking for something and uh, the elite in the city decided that maybe the centennial would be a good idea. So this one neighbor on Washington Square West said, wait a minute, here we are on Washington Square. The parade that was planned to go through the city must come down to Washington Square. And he said he had a dream. One night he says he dreamed it all. In his dream, he stood at the corner of Clinton Place, which was 8th Street, and looking toward Washington Square, beheld this white arch looming up and beneath it, a stream of troops and horsemen passing along. The next day he called upon his friend Stanford White and quote, made him acquainted with his plan for building a triumphant arch and at the same time explaining to him the design he'd seen in his dream. This was all uh, printed from an interview with uh, William Rhinelander Stewart in a newspaper, The Commercial Advertiser, on May of 1889. Well, the, we have one photograph of the arch that uh, dates from 1889 at the time of the centennial, and it looked as if things were pretty quiet at that point. Um, but originally, White's design uh, was captured by Charles Graham, who drew uh, the design from the architect's plan, where it's festooned, and it was with that statue of George Washington and many flags. No one knows where the George Washington statue is these days, but many, many flags and banners and people festively walking about. And again, you notice the street's a little bit exaggerated. Why, Fifth Avenue is never quite that wide, but the temporary arch was made of wood and plaster and paper mache, and it just spanned the street so that cars could pass, the, the carriages could pass comfortably underneath. The parade really captured the public attention and seats along the parade route, of course, were enthusiastically sought. And there were more ads in the paper. Balcony seats, Waverly Place, only a few left. Large double windows from $100 to $250. Two days, private parties only. Well, the square and the parades went on for three days. They were tremendously successful. And there were other arches in the city. But as the New York Sun reported, on April 30th at the very end, they said the one noble, imposing, beautiful arch is at the foot of Fifth Avenue. It was designed by Mr. Stamford White, and even he may well be proud of it. And so a few days after the centennial, when the temporary arch was taken down, there were already plans to build the new arch. And that arch was designed by Stanford White, who was associated with the firm of McKim Mead and White uh, Architecture, that's their formal name. And this was the North Elevation drawing from 1892. It shows all the detail which we recognize is still on the arch today uh, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the inauguration of George Washington, first president of the United States. There were some seals that were made up, not necessarily altogether authentic, but those were his seals and uh, lots of other symbols. Um, the many outstanding sculptors at the time uh, took part in doing the sculptural decoration. And the, although in the drawing, you can see there are statues of Washington, those statues didn't go in until after the First World War. Stewart was a uh, really impressive fundraiser. He raised money from all over the country there were some big donors who may have given him larger donations. There were people who sent in 25 cents, and he wrote it all down in his uh, meticulous record keeping. Um, and here he is up inspecting the arch. William Rhinelander Stewart is the gentleman in the top hat, and to the right next to him in the rounded hat is none other than Stanford White, who is sporting a very large mustache, if you've ever seen pictures of him. So the arch, of course, took a little longer than was first expected, but 
it was very, it done with great care. White took care, selecting the, the marble, and there are all sorts of issues when over the years some of that marble sugared off. That also is another topic for another day, but it was a grand, uh, a grand monument to add, to cap uh, the lower end of Fifth Avenue. And it really made the arch a very splendid place indeed in the French style. It provided a, vista, a wonderful vista uh, that would, you would see, and we still do coming down Fifth Avenue. Now, while there are uh, many people living around the park who did not have much money, there were still some of the people holding on on the north side. And one of those families particularly uh, was captured at the time of a winter wedding for a daughter. The uh, wedding was captured by Fernand Lundgren, who was living at number three, Washington Square. Uh, number three had had an extra few stories added to it, and it is where Hopper will eventually come to live. Um, and there were artist studios, and it looks as if Lundgren is simply looking from his doorway uh, to the west so he can see the arch and he can see all the people arriving. Mr. Sidney Smith and Miss Fanny Taylor uh, were married at Grace Church, followed by a grand reception at the home of Fanny's parents, Agnes, the daughter of Thomas Suffern, first owner of the house, and Edward Taylor, 11 Washington Square North. Taylor had lived uh, on Washington Square from its earliest days. The wedding on that delightful December day after the snowstorm, one of the most brilliant and enjoyable ever known to the present generation of New Yorkers, representative of New York society from the oldest families to the gay young folk of the hunting set. The most fashionable women attended in rich velvet, costly furs and exquisite laces. The list would read like the social register. The John Jacob Astors, O.H. Belmonts, Havemeyers, Cooper Hewitts and so on. So it was a very grand, very stylish wedding. We see that same kind of image as was caught by Char uh, Child Hassam when he paints this image of Washington Square in the spring, where we see the white arch, we see the street cleaners, a new device then, new practice, uh, sweeping up there, and we see a woman walking along, and it all looks lovely and genteel and quite wonderful. But in fact, things weren't always quite that lovely around Washington Square. And in 1890, the year of that first social register uh, known as the 400, uh, we know that uh, there was indeed a much poorer population and they didn't live very far away. Uh, the same year that we, we have uh, Carolyn Astor's ball going on and we see that wonderful wedding and New York's old society, um, in 1890, we see the publication of, um, by Ward McAllister of how the, society, um, how the society lives, how fine society lives. And he listed the number of people who could fit in Mrs. Astor's ballroom. And those are the people who attended that wedding. But in 1890, that very same year, uh, Jacob Rees, a Danish immigrant, went around New York and found, and found scenes that were of a very different nature. He publishes his photos in a book. He was a, a photojournalist. He publishes his photos in the book called How the Other Half Lives. And in fact, it's believed that it was far more than half of the New Yorkers who were living in such decrepit conditions. There's a photograph of some of the tenements, very rickety buildings, terribly overcrowded, or uh, this scene here of children sleeping on the streets. And already in 1894, we see another sight that might resonate for us. A woman walking through, you can see the arch behind her. She's walking through the square in a very lovely long gown um, in March, and she is being bothered by what were then called tramps. These were people who might or might not have been homeless, but they were begging and they could sometimes be quite annoying to the people passing through. If some of this sounds familiar, and we think of our park today, we see what a long history we have. Um, the two sides of New York civilization, a population that can be so uh, stretched from the ultra wealthy to those who have to sleep on the streets. 
we're going to, that ends my uh, presentation for this evening, but I just wanted to let you know that next time, next week, we will be turning into the 20th century. And suddenly when we look at Washington Square with all these wonderful people and all great uh, anecdotal information that we see, the policeman stopping a child, people climbing onto a carriage, there's the fountain, there's the arch. Uh, this is by a drawing that was made and colored by William Glackens, who had a studio on the south side of the square, and it was published in a national weekly. By 1910, it's a big difference now, by 1910, the whole world, certainly all of the United States, would know about Washington Square. So thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really good timing. <laughs> yeah, I tried, yes. Okay. Um, so um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or the uh, question and answer box quite yet, but um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your sources. Um, I've read your book, so I, I kind of know the answer, but I think it's an amazing amount of research you did for the book um, and hence this talk. So I was just wondering a little bit of, if you can share about some of the sources you used um, to write it. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went through all the books that had been written about Greenwich Village and I found there wasn't any one book about the park, but that gave me a lot of information. And then I started, because I do love old magazines, and I started to look at the microfilms, both at the New York and old places, uh, the New York Historical Society. I went through the NYU archives and found all kinds of treasures. Um, and I used, spent hours in the basements on those uh, with the old newspapers. Um, there's a wonderful source um, that was compiled in uh, 1926, which uh, puts together all the records of, it's called the iconography of New York, which puts together from the earliest 1600s, any mention of anything that was going on in any newspaper, any item. Um, and so from that working out, I just went through looking for Washington Square and the site of Washington Square um, and somehow after a while it came together. It was an education for me. I was, as you said, trained as an art historian, not as an urban historian. And so I needed to learn a lot. Um, yeah. But it goes on. I, every time I review and I look at the material, I think of more, more things that I want to know about. Yeah. <laughs> You're lucky to live near such an historic spot. I, yes, most definitely. And you have a really great bird's eye view. Um, so um, we're coming up on the hour. Um, I don't have any questions coming through. I do have, um, uh, Alan uh, would like to say, wonderful talk, Emily. Um, yeah. Pat, um, amazing as always. She learns so much every time you talk. And Susie says, a wonderful presentation, thank you. So um, if we don't have any more questions, because I can ask uh, <laughs> I can ask Emily questions at any point, we'll, we'll let everyone get to their dinners and thank you so much. Thank you. Um, next week. Yeah, so um, if you haven't already, make sure you register for uh, Emily's talk next week. It's the second half. We have a little bit of a, <laughs> we have a little bit of a treat here. We have a little bit of a peak. Um, and we're looking forward. Thank you, Emily. Sure. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. Bye-bye.